Okay. Welcome to the Michigan Watercolor Art Talk Series. My name is Rocco Pisto. I'm now President Emeritus of the Michigan Watercolor Society, and uh, which means I get to do whatever I want, I think, until they tell me not to. Uh, so uh, today we have Sam Connect. And I don't remember how I found you, Sam, other than you were uh, a new signature member of the Michigan Watercolor Society this year, which is awesome. And uh, you were part of the reception at the Hanna Center at the K-Rod Gallery this summer. And, and that was just a, a magnificent day, at least in my mind. It, we had a full crowd, a lot of, a lot of uh, recognition to a lot of people which is what Michigan watercolor is all about. And for those of you that are our new one, either to Michigan watercolor, welcome. I know we have a couple of new folks, Diane and uh, June, thanks for joining. And they found us at the Anton Art Center when we had the travel show out there. So uh, I'm glad you found that interesting enough to think that you'd uh, wanna be part of this organization. We, we're always looking for new members. Uh, that's how we keep this thing alive for uh, 76 years now. And because uh, what happens is the old ones die. And uh, so we need to replace them eventually. A little morbid, but that's the reality. But anyways, on to positive things. Uh, I found Sam and, uh, and our our history kind of kind of coincided around the same time. I. He graduated a couple of years from, from school, from art school before I did. But uh, let me just tell you who Sam is and, uh, and we'll, we'll kind of go from there. So I'll give you his education first. He got his uh, bachelor's in fine arts degree in painting at Michigan State University from uh, in 1971. Uh, he went on to uh, got, get his master's in fine art at the University of Michigan. Again, the concentration in painting. And he uh, did some work, some post-grad coursework at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. And uh, that seemed pretty relevant, seeing that uh, you were into a lot of portrait stuff and, and made had some connection there. But uh, during his uh, career as an artist and educator, uh, Sam, taught at Hillsdale College. He taught uh, courses in oil painting, watercolor, figure drawing, basic drawing, history of, of uh, Italian Renaissance art, history of American art, and managed uh, some of the exhibition series and courses in a tempera, which we'll talk about a little bit. Okay. Uh, he's been an instructor at Kindle College. Uh, he's been a guest associate professor of art at the University of Michigan in, uh, I saw something, oh yeah, and as being part of the program in Florence, Italy, which uh, is awesome. I, I had gone there with Eastern Michigan back in 73, and you were doing this back in, uh, later on it looks like back in the 80s so that was pretty neat so as we kind of talk through sam's work feel free to ask questions or text in the box we want to keep it as interactive as possible and uh, uh just a couple announcements before we get started uh we've gotten a number of requests for how do i pay my membership middle of uh, creating a new web page, a new portal, uh, where we can start doing this online, I hope here in the next month or so, from what I understand. So hang in there. We're, we've changed the membership uh, time period instead of our fiscal year, which ends in September to calendar year, just to make life easier. So uh, dues will be uh, required uh, in 2020, January, 2023. Or if you pay now, they apply to uh, the 2023 calendar year and you'll get, you know, newsletters, announcements and those kind of things. So uh, make sure you sign up. So, Sam, welcome. Uh, Thank you, Rocco. 
we had a nice little chat yesterday about your work. And uh, so why don't you just kind of give us, a, a given kind of the highlights of your education and your teaching, uh, let's kind of go from there. Maybe some highlight things that uh, you can bring to mind. Yeah, thanks, Rocco. And thanks, everyone, for uh, attending today. I'm, I'm uh, truly excited by this and honored by the Watercolor Society uh, for bestowing the Signature Status Award uh, this past summer. Um, it, uh, it, it certainly increases my love and regard for the Michigan Watercolor Society. So thrilled to be here with you today and to talk watercolor and aspects of, uh, of a life in art. Yeah, so you, I, yeah go I ahead. Just, I was just gonna say, your work is very diverse. So if you go on uh, Sam's website, just Google Sam Connect, and uh, we'll, set, we'll give you contact information after this as well. So don't do it now. But uh, your work is diverse from very, I mean, it's all very realistic uh, from what I can tell, whether it's oil painting, watercolor, uh, or the egg tempera stuff. I, it's all amazing. And your portraits. So let's kind of talk about some of your work. Okay. Uh, well, I'd like, I'd like to lead off actually uh, by way of continuing the introduction with talking about how watercolor is in my family gene pool. Uh, I'm really third generation uh, devotee of watercolor. My grandfather, who was a great inspiration, was a gifted amateur painter who, uh, in his retirement from his, his uh, day job, built a studio for himself, North Window, Fireplace, The Works. And um, so anytime we'd visit uh, him in, in my grandparents in Grand Rapids, uh, after the obligatory family time, he and I would sneak off to the studio and uh, I would watch some magic, you know, as a, let's say I was 10 years old and um, I'd watch the magic, you know, he'd do some things with a palette knife and oil paint or, you know, his, his art books were there and I was bitten by the bug. And then uh, my dad uh, trained as a landscape architect and um, I still have a few of his artworks, drawings, and even uh, watercolor architectural rendering. So between grandfather and father, uh, there were there were uh, pictures on the wall of the home I grew up in, and um, gifts of art art uh, supplies at Christmas and birthday, and so it uh, it was a really great um, incubator for uh, a, a, a talent. Uh, it did bother my father when I decided to major in art at Michigan State. I'd had good grades in high school, and you know, like any uh, concerned father would say, you know, really, <laughs> that's your plan. But um, yeah, I think by the time I was uh, a sophomore at Michigan State, I began to do the math, like. Oh, how am I going to make a living on this uh, and, uh, you know, pay the bills? So I got a teaching certificate, fully expecting if, that if I was lucky, I'd get a, a job in a high school and, uh, you know, do the whole student teaching thing and all of that. And then um, after graduating, somebody tipped me off that Kendall School of Design, it was just School of Design back then in the uh, early 70s that they were hiring in their foundation department. So um, I threw my hat in the ring and much to my amazement, they hired me to teach uh, first year students, one of several of us that were in the uh, first year department. And uh, it was a three year school um, and a, a wonderful launch to a, a career in teaching and, and learning from uh, colleague artists there. So, um, but then uh, I realized that with just a bachelor of fine arts degree, uh, you know, this is like 1972 or so, uh, the word was starting to circulate, oh, you're not going to last in college art teaching unless you get a master of fine arts degree. So I left Kendall, 
pursued that and achieved that uh, at Michigan and um, giving me rights to brag on whichever team wins between state and U of M. So, uh, and then I was lucky to, uh, you know, for, for about six years, I taught part-time at a variety of places like Spring Arbor, Hillsdale, um, evening courses at Ellis Sharp Museum in Jackson. And then finally, a full-time slot opened up at Hillsdale. Um, they put it on me and uh, I became a lifer. So that's kind of a snapshot of uh, the, the, the beginnings. I also want to say that, um, and it's kind of my running joke, that watercolor was my first love. And you never forget your first love. <laughs> Although I've strayed, <laughs> you know, gotten deep into oil painting and then uh, like a crazy man, uh, deep into egg tempera. Uh, and, you know, Rocco mentioned uh, some versatility or range. Uh, sometimes I, I like to say that I'm schizophrenic. That <laughs> I keep ricocheting between watercolor, oil, and egg tempera. But whenever I return to watercolor, especially, I feel like, oh yes, I'm back home. This is what I love to do. I love the way the paint and the water hits the paper and um, all the wonderful surprises. Even with tight work, there's still things that, you know, you have to be attentive to uh, in terms of how it all starts to stack up. So I just wanted to, um, Kind of get that going, and um, and also uh, my my uh, involvement with the watercolor society goes back to the early '80s when I first started entering the annual shows, and um, I don't remember what the year was when I first got tapped with a, a modest award, but it was it was in the '80s, and um, yeah, then... I, I pulled up. Uh... I'm the keeper of all the catalogs that are available. And uh, then I pulled up the one for 1998, which I think was our 55th annual, because it was 20 years, it was easy to remember. And, uh, and back then they weren't shooting a lot of the pictures because uh, it was expensive or if they did, they were in black and white, but I saw your name, I just found it a few minutes ago and, and found your name on there in the catalog. Oh, how about that? I didn't see the artwork, but uh... oh, uh -huh. yeah, I'm I'm trying to think what I might have entered in '98, uh, but um, I I have uh, once we get into my uh, we'll call it a slideshow today. Uh, I did include uh, two or three pictures that I know had had received some recognition in the annuals, so um, look forward to. Uh, sharing that and certainly to validate what the uh, watercolor society does with its annual competitions and its many programs were you in were you involved at all uh other than entering the shows yeah i was rocco uh i um, i became the slide librarian for a stretch of a few years i don't remember how long but i was the keeper of the 35 million millimeter slides <laughs> of which there were plenty, you know, all the various right. prior years uh, categorized. And um, then there were times when uh, an organization would want to uh, uh, borrow the, the slides, maybe all of them, I don't remember, or just particular years. And uh, then I'd be responsible for um, sending those out and, and make sure, making sure they got back and all that. I wish you were still doing that because then we'd have access to them. Yeah. Well, where are they? Uh, uh, they could be with the last historian that, uh, I won't get into it. Oh my, oh golly. We have not seen oh. anything of the past uh, 20 years other than things that presidents have given me to keep track of, so. Whoa. Oh gosh! Yeah, you know, yeah. Well, I, I mean, want to. Uh, I also want to mention that um, as I chaired the art department at Hillsdale College for uh, several decades, um, early on, especially, I um, 
and it was probably when I was a slide library, and it was easy to say, well, let's include Hillsdale as a part of the statewide tour. And, um, and so we were very happy, uh, particularly in the early, early 90s when Hillsdale got a, uh, a new building to house art, music, and theater, and we have a decent gallery there. So then uh, we started um, becoming a part of the, uh, the rotation. I'll never forget even making a plexiglass, big, you know, like three foot square plexiglass sign with the uh, Watercolor Society logo on it. Yeah. You know, had to make a stencil and spray paint the uh, MWCS on it. Well, hopefully and, we'll get back there someday and do right. that. And, and folks, I've shared information with Rocco on the current chairman of the art department who, um, happily is maintaining watercolor painting in the curriculum. And um, there are not that many colleges or universities that uh, support watercolor. Right. And uh, it was one of the first things that I did when I started teaching there in, in the 70s was to, um, to uh, in officially incorporate watercolor in the art curriculum. I'd been teaching it summers uh, for pin money uh, for a while in the 70s. And then when I went full time in about 79, um, I had it passed. And um, and so we'd, we'd offer it every other spring uh, with the belief that watercolor is not for total beginners in, uh, in painting. Uh, our philosophy was, uh, you know, get a, a foundation of drawing, uh, have some experience with oil painting, which is more forgiving, as I'm sure you all know, uh, and um, and so then uh, this way uh, we you know kind of build up a, a cadre of interest each time watercolor uh, rolled around and um, have good enrollments. We had we offered two semesters of experience in it, and uh, it was great, and it's it's still rolling along at Hillsdale, and I'm very very proud of that. For those of you that are new uh, to the organization, uh, Michigan Watercolor has an annual exhibition in, in different parts of the state. So this year we were in Detroit area. Next year we're in the Holland, uh, that West Coast area. The next year we're up in Traverse City and then we'll be back in Detroit in uh, 2025. And uh, what happens is we try to find our, our award show, which is half of the annual exhibition. So 30 pieces will travel to different galleries within the area to, to really support underserved communities and have the experience of seeing our show like you guys did up in Anton. So I just wanted to let you know what's happening there. Well, All great. right, Sam, let's talk about your work. Okay, uh, shall I? Shall we uh, get our yeah. screens yeah. prepped for that? I, I gave okay. you access, so you should have it. All right. Yes, I see. And what I'm going to do is uh, start clicking on my images, so we'll get them stacking up here. I tell you, I went into your uh, website again this morning to look at some things and. Uh, I loved your morning light on the Arno. Oh, I, how about that? I forgot I, that, that was there. As, as, I, as I mentioned to you yesterday, I studied in Florence for six weeks when I was at Eastern. And I took a picture from the uh, Uffizi, which is one of the main museums in Florence and, uh, and shooting towards the, the, old, the old bridge and uh, Ponte Vecchio. And uh, but I liked your painting better. Oh my! <laughs> well, thank you, thank you so much. Yeah. So, um, do uh, does everyone see uh, a few pieces up? A few pieces kind of up. on top of each other. Yeah. And I I noticed just now I were all, I could only capture ten, which surprised me. But uh, maybe when we get through th through the first ten, there might be about a half a dozen more. Okay. To, to bounce through and then the uh, the contact page. Maybe you can click on the, uh, looks like you're on a Mac or something. Uh, yeah, I'm on a Mac. Mm -hmm. uh, if there's a box that opens up to one image. 
uh, like at the top. Oh, no, that's not yet. Uh, no, I think I think we'll probably be able to just proceed the way we are right now. Okay, whatever works. So, uh, folks, uh, Rocco said, "Well, why not make sure you include the uh, the painting you had in the uh, in th this year's show?" So we're going to lead off with uh, the little Union River waterfall uh, that you should see on your screen now, and um, that one uh, was painted uh, right on location. Back in 2016, when I was fortunate to be uh, for about three and a half weeks, an artist in residence at the Michigan's Porcupine Mountains uh, Wilderness Park in the west end of the uh, Upper Peninsula. And what they do with their artist uh, in residence uh, recipients is you get lodged in a rustic timber frame cabin uh, deep in the woods. Uh, you can't even drive to the cabin. You have to drive a certain way through the park, uh, leave your car, and then hike pretty much an old ski trail to the cabin itself. A uh, wonderful cabin that was built by park volunteers maybe 10, 20 years ago. And uh, it has no running water, but there's a stream, a little river nearby, just steps away from the cabin. Uh, and no electricity, um, had a small camp type propane stove and oven and a, a, uh, an outhouse with a composting uh, facility, so to speak. So I was, I was, um, I was really geeked about this experience, uh, particular, uh, particularly with a love for the uh, Upper Peninsula in general and North Country country, broadly speaking. When I was a, a kid, my family had a cabin in Northern Ontario uh, on a wilderness lake, uh, you know, almost similar circumstances in terms of the, um, the lack of uh, modern amenities. And so when I got to this um, location for the start of my residency, I was so pumped up, I pretty much dropped everything and went over to this river and started painting. So it was um, done on a on a um, uh, a hot pressed paper. Perhaps you can tell by the lack of, uh, of grain texture, and um, it was you know it was painted with a lot of uh, enthusiasm, very loose, and uh, so I was very pleased to get it into the uh, into the watercolor show this uh, this year. Now, incidentally, um, I'm not a purist when it comes to watercolor. Uh, this one has a little bit of opaque paint down in the lower left. Uh, some of those um, little splashes of, of uh, water are really with, um, you know, with a gouache white. Um, but but the great majority of the painting is with uh, with big transparent washes. And we won't hold that against you because we're not, <laughs> we're not a transparent watercolor organization. So. Uh, our members can use watercolor, gouache, India ink, French watercolor crayons. As long as it's on paper, uh, work can be submitted. Great. Well, you know, the, my feeling is uh, what did Singer Sargent do? What did Winslow Homer do? They both would use touches of opaque, opaque paint in their watercolors. And so if it was okay for them, then it's got to be okay for the rest of us, uh, depending on our wishes. Well, we'll move on. Uh, you know, I mentioned a Canadian cabin. This was uh, very nearly, uh, very close to my early beginnings in watercolor. I think I was maybe about 18 and uh, paddled across from our cottage and uh, in a canoe, tied up along the bank and started this watercolor. Um, and, you know, at the time I thought, oh, well, you know, this is, this is a bit of a breakthrough moment in terms of painting on location, uh, painting from nature. Uh, and I always felt what I knew about Winslow Homer and even Andrew Wyeth was this um, truth to nature philosophy and, you know, feeling the, the immersion and so on. And I also like to point out that, um, when my uh, water can 
when the water got muddy, I just dump it in the lake and scoop up some, some <laughs> fresh water and uh, keep going. You know, what, what's really interesting is that at 18, you controlled yourself from just adding too many colors. Well, I think already I was under the spell of Wyeth uh, and, um, you know, a more subdued palette. So, uh, I, folks, I must admit to a, a, a lifelong fascination with Wyeth. Sometimes it's uh, a little uh, love-hate or, you know, but I think eventually I found my own voice, but benefited, learned a lot from studying what, um, what Wyeth had done. Never feeling that I could ever have as wild an imagination or as wild a painting technique as he had. You know, some of his watercolors are just jaw dropping in their fluidity, their spontaneity, the attack, uh, the, the risk taking and more. But um, we each have our own journey and this has been a part of mine. Now, as a, as a kid who loved realistic painting, um, being at in an art department in a state university in the 60s and early 70s, those, I don't have to stress the point too much, those were challenging times. And I felt schizophrenic back then. Uh, I had, I felt impelled to paint more uh, broadly and abstractly in uh, painting classes under the, uh, uh, the, the influence of the, the young Turks that were teaching painting uh, at that time. And then I'd paint uh, my own Wyeth influenced way outside of class. So I was leading a double, double life really, but um, really learning lot, lots from both tracks, shall we say. I, I'm not bitter about the uh, lack of support in the undergraduate days, uh, there was uh, some useful support here and there, and then, uh, and I, you know, I learned a lot through the the challenges. All right. Well, then, you know, part of that challenge was how do you how do you reconcile being a uh, a diehard realist and yet come to grips with abstraction. Well, this next one, which I think did get into the watercolor shows uh, or, you know, a show in the 80s and got a, a modest award. Um, this, the, the springboard for doing this was um, part of my first trip to Italy in 83. And even then I was, um, you know, talking, painting with... Uh, uh, a new hire in the art department at Hillsdale College, Brian Curtis. Now, Brian um, left Hillsdale after a few years and wound up uh, heading up the painting department at the University of Miami in Florida. But while he was at Hillsdale, he was doing some in interesting things uh, with students in his painting classes where he had them make collages from trash. And he, he introduced me to the like early 20th century German movement for making so-called MERS pictures, trash pictures and collages and so on. So I thought, well, this is pretty interesting. So this was my uh, first foray into doing something that where, you know, it's, it's a realistic abstraction. It's just natural forces, peeling posters, and um, it is what it is. Well, that it's was still, how the advertising was done in Europe. On, yeah, this was, on uh, the... based, it was based on a slide that I had taken uh, uh, somewhere in Italy. I don't know, remember if it was Florence or Venice, but um, you can see peeling posters most anywhere in Europe. And uh, I've still gotten a kick out I, in subsequent trips to Italy, at least, uh, uh, keep my eye out for interesting walls, you know, that are showing this kind of passage of time and decay and all those highfalutin things. So was the, uh, is the verbiage all painted or was that yeah. actual? No, there's no collage. It's all <laughs> meant to be like a trompe l'oeil, a uh, eye thing. So it was, it was tough. Awesome. 
All right, well, we, we can move on. Now this one, um, and again, the, all the pattern that you saw in the one with the peeling posters, then I started to uh, get intrigued with the patterns of quilts and then uh, did this painting in 92 and uh, fortunate to, fortunately speaking, it got the top prize in the uh, watercolor annual in 92. Um, called Amelia's Quilt. And um, I had been toying with the idea of doing a, a painting of a model with a quilt. And this girl was uh, modeling for art classes here at Hillsdale, a um, swimmer who uh, was really great with posing. And so um, I, I must say, I did this from photographs of her. We had a long photo session in which I was trying some more, more of those sort of cheesecakey reclining poses, and it was pretty silly. But at the end of the posing session, she uh, she just wound up looking like this, and I thought, oh my God, that has wonderful possibilities. And so the painting ensued. And um, this was done, I think, on Windsor Newton uh, cold press paper, which uh, uh, I've returned to from time to time. And it was really a, a, an exceptional paper in terms of managing darks. I remember painting the background wash washes over maybe three times. Uh, first time, not surprisingly, it dried too light, even though I was trying to pack a lot of pigment into it. Second one, I overdid it and it went dark, almost flat black. Uh, so gave it another go, and uh, third time, uh, it just kind of settled nicely, particularly with the the very dull light that's behind her head to just to the right of her head. And um, so sometimes, and you know, you you folks have probably each experienced someone looking at your work and say, "Oh, well, you know, I couldn't, I didn't know watercolor could go that dark." But any seasoned watercolor veteran knows that you can get amazingly rich darks, which can still possess a feeling of atmosphere and depth. And um, so uh, this was this was a, uh, a painting that, you know, challenged me to the limits of my ability at the time. And uh, I was very pleased by the response it got. That's awesome. Very nice. Thank you. Well, moving on. So here's a here's a non-commissioned portrait uh, of a guy that I uh, ran across uh, a few summers ago when I was camping in the Keweenaw Peninsula in the Upper Peninsula and uh, camping with a buddy. And um, so my my friend would go around with his camera and I would go around and paint. And uh, this one I, I confess was done from photographs, but I morphed together uh, the, the image of the fellow into um, a background of one of these great uh, red limestone arches that can be found in Calumet, Michigan. Uh, I don't know if any of you folks are familiar with Calumet, but it's just fascinating boom town that decayed and it's trying to drag itself up from uh, uh, decline when the mining industry uh, uh, shut down in the 1960s but in its heyday it was a it was a boom city with extraordinary buildings with um, with great detail and stonework which uh, i've loved seeing sam so, there's a question uh do you yeah. use, do you use masking this one didn't have any masking. It just required that I had to be very, very careful as I did the dark uh, background in within the arch and bring it up to um, his hair and around the the cap and so on. Um, yeah, I I've used masking, and uh, you know sometimes I love it, sometimes I hate it. You know if depending on the masking product. Uh, and uh, 
you know, if your if your wash seeps under the mask film, uh, it's it's a horror. Or if you slop, or if you if you make too thin or not wide enough uh, of a mask uh, pathway, and then you accidentally slop inside of that, then that that is vexing. So and and masking usually gives itself away pretty clearly. Um, you know, I think some have been able to use it uh, uh, with exceptional results. You know, I think Wyeth did a night scene of uh, the Kerner farmhouse once with um, all kinds of, it was a nighttime scene with all kinds of patches of snow uh, beyond the house, uh, all kind of lit up in moonlight. And I've looked at that and thought he had to have masked, but maybe it was rubber cement that, where he just drizzled it on and got these loopy things going on in it. In it. Um, but I don't, I don't like to use rubber cement because I understand that archivally it's acidic and uh, some right. residue can seep into the paper and create some problems uh, down the line. All right, well, we should move on. Uh, I did mask with this one. <laughs> Now here's the story on this. This is the Florence Cathedral, and in 1983, uh, I was um, well taking po post grad courses in the U University of Michigan uh, Florence program, and uh, even though the coursework was fairly intense, there was a lot of downtime. So I would I would go downtown um, and uh, set up my uh, my portable easel, which was basically a piece of plywood that I rigged to attach to a, uh, a conventional photographer's tripod. And this was a full sheet watercolor. And, um, you know, I'd sit on a camp stool and, and just draw, draw, draw. I actually logged 30 hours doing the drawing part of this before color ever hit the paper. And I just wanted to get the um, the perspective right. And at the time, I was enamored of the uh, history of the construction of the dome and the, its design by Filippo Brunelleschi, uh, who also gave us the rudiments of uh, one point linear perspective. And so I wound up calling this uh, homage to Brunelleschi. Uh, and using also the nickname for the dome, Il Duomo. So um, it was kind of a marathon of, uh, of just drawing and then doing the color work, uh, which I did there. And uh, by the time I did, did the, um, I had everything done but the sky and the, the program ended, I had to come home. So I ended up uh, doing the sky wash uh, at home very, very carefully masking the perimeter of the architecture. So I think it got an award in the uh, watercolor annual, you know, sometime in the in the late 80s. Great. Now this that was that's about as obsessive as and tight as I've ever been in watercolor. And uh, I, I'm aware of that. I'm aware of you know the the dangers of overworking and just getting mindlessly caught up in detail. Uh, so there was another trip to Italy in which um, I just took this uh, stab at painting the cathedral and the uh, uh, baptistry from uh, an angle I hadn't considered before. And so this was uh, more of a sprint. And, uh, you know, I don't even remember why the wash in the, uh, the foreground on the ground plane happened the way it did, but um, I'm very happy about that result. Was it raining? <laughs> no, I don't think so. Uh, I think it was, I was in a hurry and, uh, you know, probably had to go back to to dinner with, uh, with the rest of the group. And um, I think this was probably during the time that where I took Fieldsdale College art students to Florence. Uh, we, we would stay typically a month and, um, you know, I coached them in watercolor and uh, and drawing. I mean, it was both um, doing watercolor or else uh, drawing outside everywhere. 
you know, up in the Piazzale de Michelangelo or by the baptistry and on and on. So it was a great, great time. I remember going into uh, Santa Cruci, which was the church that Michelangelo was baptized in and praying to God to tell me, do you want me to be an artist? I oh, didn't my. hear anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, he, he, he doesn't answer as much. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully he's listening. So from, from the uh, uh, amazing engineering and complexity of the Duomo, uh, there are times when I love just very ordinary uh, settings. Uh, I guess I've done a lot of architecture with watercolor, but I'm not limited to that. I love landscape and portrait just as much. But this was an Amish farm uh, near where my, my uh, wife grew up, East Central Ohio. And um, I, we would go um, and visit her parents when they were still alive. And uh, after socializing a lot with family, then I excuse myself and go out and look for something to, uh, to paint. And at this farm, I had, I had previously met the, um, the young farmer who, uh, who at, the, at, at an earlier time saw me out at the road taking pictures of his farm. And then we got acquainted. And uh, so one time my, uh, my wife and I were visiting uh, her parents and uh, I went over to the farm and I, I was greeted by the young farmer and he said, oh, it happens to be our anniversary. And uh, it was a beautiful day uh, in September and we were on fall break from teaching. And uh, my wife is a music, music teacher at Hillsdale College, violin and viola. Well, anyway, the young farmer says it's our anniversary. Uh, we were married um, 13 years ago. And that was not only 13 years ago, but 11 kids back. <laughs> So uh, I couldn't resist this view of the wash on the line uh, set up and made the painting on the spot uh, and uh, felt good about the way it turned out, all that wonderful light and color. There are times when I feel like, oh, maybe this is an opportunity to channel Edward Hopper, or this is a Wyeth opportunity or a singer sergeant opportunity. I mean, it's not like I'm always looking for one of the past masters for an excuse, but it, at the very least, I think it kind of gets me into a mindset where um, I think, okay, now I need to be th um, thinking about a consistency of attack here. And um, I try to do everything in, in some erratic way. I love your mundane uh, imagery and you make it so exciting. Oh, well, I, thank you. I've, thank you. I've lived in Ohio for 20 years. I, I've been to a lot of these little towns. They all look the same. And, uh, and you just made it uh, more magical for me. Well, thanks, Rocco. Uh, yeah, I, I love small town America. Uh, you know, Hillsdale is not very large, uh, but it's still a county seat and a college town. But there are plenty of, of very ordinary neighborhoods. And, uh, you know, I just love noticing the geometry of houses, the way they might cluster together, or you might see an occasional steeple or county tower popping up over the, um, the neighborhoods. And, um, uh, I've just enjoyed that kind of uh, everyday quality. So now this is this is um, back in the uh, uh, the Porcupine Mountains again from that uh, residency. So this was another view of that stream that uh, that was very very close to the, the cabin in which I lodged. And uh, this one. Um, Previous to doing this one, I, I spent three days working on this same composition uh, right there. Uh, and actually, the, the legs of my uh, portable easel. Now, nowadays, uh, I use a, um, a French easel when I'm painting on location. And, uh, you know, you can put a 
full sheet watercolor board or you know a drawing board 24 by 30 let's say on a conventional French easel and it works great but in this one um I had to stand on rocks in the river and the uh two of the three legs of the easel were in the water <laughs> and I, I realized at the first day I tried that that I couldn't collapse the legs after the painting session because the uh, the skinny leg that is the bottom that went into the water the wood swelled and I couldn't jam it back up in its track with the uh, the upper leg in each case so then I figured out a way to take uh, grocery bags plastic bags and duct tape them around the uh, the bottom of the uh, the easel legs to keep them dry <laughs> and so it was like okay you know I, all of you who have painted on location you know there are so many little challenges whether it's wind or or you name it but anyway I had spent three days on a previous composition of this and felt like I'd overworked it that it was kind of stale so I decided uh okay I have the luxury of time I'm not beholden to anyone else's schedule I'll take a new stab at it use some um, hot press paper and uh, and give it a go so this one I was pleased with uh because it it just had a little more life sometimes I look at it and I think oh it's way too busy but um it was an enjoyable romp at the time just to try to get those brushes to dance around and look at the the broken color that was happening in the water especially but also the um you know the kind of the rusty browns that you see in the distant uh hill uh because of the pine needles that create a bed of the uh the woodland floor and uh, you know you get this kind of complementary red brown versus blue green in the uh, the pine pine boughs and then, of course, there was the uh, ever-present problem of reserving the white of the paper in the areas of the moving water or even the birch trees way in the distance. And, you know, painting around the birch, white birch trunks, but then coming back and throwing in some soft shadows and this and that. I'm always uh, interested in the the role of shadows in a painting, uh, the the abstraction of shadows whether it's stripy shadows that drape across a a, a dirt road uh, in the autumn or the stripy shadows that are on that hill uh, and of course the breakup of uh of uh, shapes little strokey shapes in the water Dan, we've got about 10 minutes okay well then let's let's fast forward here um another one that went into the watercolor annual a few years ago up in Saginaw fading ferns uh painted from a photograph that I had taken and when I painted this one I didn't do a single pencil line to begin I just started putting color shapes down and I, th I figured it was time that I gave myself a challenge in that regard whoops and did I lose them I think I Oh, okay. Hang on. That is our final. Oh, I think these might have pulled up in the in an air order that I wasn't expecting. But this is an egg tempera. And um we can save the discussion of egg tempera from another for another time. It's, uh, yeah. it's way tedious. But we, this was we can't see it yet. Oh, okay. Can we um share screen it? Yeah, yeah, let me do that. Uh, I, I can select these now. Okay. And I'm looking for my contact page. I don't see that, but I think I'll be able to grab that uh, in a bit. There we go. Okay, yeah, all right. Well, I was just uh, talking a bit about this being an egg tempera, and it was 
done after um, I had done a watercolor study of it, which we see here. And th this was done um, sitting in the backyard and, you know, day after morning after morning and uh, painting the, the scene there with an old stone smokehouse and a, a big old hawthorn tree. And, you know, the detail. Way too much detail. <laughs> I don't think I would ever approach a painting like that uh, anymore. Here was a, a kind of a commission, uh, the Ann Arbor Observer um, monthly newspaper uh, asked me to do a, a, a cover painting for them. Uh, and we together we settled on the Law Quad at the University of Michigan. And um, I ran around with a camera and started sizing up compositions and angles and wound up with this. Uh, got a couple of Hillsdale students to to pose there as, uh, as uh, can we call call them co-eds anymore? Uh, <laughs> but um, anyway, I, the, the uh, Ann Arbor Observer masthead then was superimposed in publication uh, over the, uh, the dark shadow uh, of the arch. And so, um, you know, I was happy to have that opportunity and to play with architecture and, and people. Now, this one uh, was painted on Monhegan Island. Uh, I was um, invited to come along with a half a dozen other artists to Monhegan back in 2013. And we stayed uh, for a week in um, lodging at a place called the uh, Monhegan House, which is uh, like about a 24 room inn. And Monhegan was thrilling to visit and to paint at. Uh, some of my heroes, Wyeth, um, Winslow Homer, I think had painted there, Rockwell Kent, Jamie Wyeth, and um, well, even Edward Hopper and Robert Henry. So um, it, it felt like hallowed ground. And uh, there is this Seacoast Memorial there <clears throat> that remembers um, one or two uh, victims of drowning. And uh, I got totally absorbed in that and painted it um, almost entirely on location, except for the sky. And I don't think I even masked the, uh, the, the cross and the life preservers when I did the sky. but. That one, by the way, folks, was painted on uh, twin rocker watercolor paper. Hmm. There was somebody in the group who who uh, told me about twin rocker and gave me a couple of sheets of it. And um, I loved painting on it. It just, just behaved so nicely. I, I don't yeah. quite know. The it just... Pardon? I think someone was asking a question. Uh, no, just maybe, maybe I was, I, I thought I was on mute, but Marilyn Dolenskis used to paint on uh, Twin Rocker all the time. Okay. okay yeah. It's a really yeah. cool paper with an amazing decal edge. Yes. Which I'm sure a lot of people love to, uh, to, to display uh, with a float mounting. But Looks this was like an oil painting. Well, it was, uh, you know, there are times when I think I should return uh, to the subject at least and do it as a tempera. But um, we'll see. This was another Monhagen scene uh, the, in the hallway of the inn where we stayed. And I titled it The Odd Couple. This was in the show, too. Yeah, it was in the show a year or two back. Right. And uh, so you get a glimpse of the ocean and the, uh, the, the, the fun kind of um, shingle-sided little lobsterman houses and other buildings on, on that island. Now, uh, back to the subject of egg tempera. This is, uh, this is a tempera portrait, the official portrait of Michigan Supreme Court Justice Stephen Markman, who uh, retired from the Supreme Court two years ago. But um, just this coming Wednesday, he will finally have a reception to honor his career with the Michigan court. And we will unveil this, uh, this portrait uh, up in the uh, the Hall of Justice in the Lansing Capitol complex complex uh, this coming Wednesday. 
So that was um, that was a a, a long term process to do his portrait, and I'm glad that we finally get to have a public un unveiling. And just just so that you don't think that all I do are decrepit old white men uh, uh, in my my character portraits, here's a tempera that I did of um, uh, of a black girl from Kenya who attended Hillsdale College, and uh, one of the loveliest loveliest uh, most gracious uh, students I've ever encountered at Hillsdale, and uh, she had this terrific dress that her mother had sent her from Nairobi. And when I asked her to um, to pose for a portrait, she suggested the dress. And uh, of course, I fell in love with the whole idea. But then here's an old guy painted in egg tempera, which um, I did this past winter. And he's certainly in the winter of his life. Uh, I, this earned the second prize in last summer's uh, mid-year exhibition at the Butler Institute of American Art in Youngstown, Ohio. And this is a guy who uh, lives off the grid in Hillsdale County, whom I befriended uh, about 10 years ago and uh, did an earlier egg tempera of him, of him uh, back in 09 that got a nice award in a members competition hosted by the Portrait Society of America. But this winter I decided it was high time that I uh, got back with uh, with Henry and tried a new idea. So there's that. Great. And now have I lost you? No, you you're still here. Me? Okay. I'm I'm just wondering if I can pick up the um the contact page that I prepared. And I'm not sure. If you see it on your computer, just you can bring it yeah, up, I I'm, guess. Okay, let me, yeah, let me pop around and. Or I can come over and do it for you. <laughs> yeah, why don't you? Hang on. You're only about 100 miles from me. There, there. Now, is that showing up or do I need to? Um... Not yet. Okay, let me find my Zoom button and get that going. Usually, when you're sharing, it allows you to share your desktop or whatever, but maybe right. there's different pages on the desktop you have to click on. Yeah, like hang on while I'm, uh, I have to jump back to the, uh, the initial email sign in, I think. Is there any any questions while we're we're doing that from anyone? I hope this was as enjoyable for you as it was for me. Uh, very talented. Every aspect of his work. I'm I'm just uh, I've become a, a big fan, Sam. So thank you. Thank you, Rocco. Um, yeah. Like you said at the at the beginning, uh, you know, since I'm fumbling around and I don't want to waste your time, folks, uh, my as Rocco mentioned, if you Google Sam Connect, uh, my website is www.connectstudio.com, and um, my I can verbally give you my email, which is s k n e c H T, in other words, uh, S Connect at hillsdale.edu. And uh, I, I hope that uh, if anyone has any questions you want to follow up with, please do um, email me and uh, we'll go from there. I'm, uh, let's see. Oh, thanks. <laughs> I'll leave that. There we go. <laughs> if you can see that yeah th that's an old phone number and i need to get with my webmaster and change that to my uh my cell number that's the landline which uh i'm sure many of you know uh, uh this hardly is a beautiful landline thing. anymore this is yeah, a beautiful. Mont Hagen. yeah that was great fun
And uh, let's see, where was it that I saw? It was Unique Works. Here's another beautiful piece. That's a tempera. Yeah. Well, thanks for popping these up. Now, I don't know if in if you could find the uh, the one that shows the signing of the Constitution. So yeah, I will. That's in, in unique, or well, yeah, you mentioned this one. Yeah, I really yeah. like this just because I, I've been there, I've been on the bridge, and and I was trying to find interesting ways of, of showing this bridge, and you've done an outstanding job. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that was, I mean, if you're in Italy, you 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 uh, you'd be crazy if you don't give yourself permission to paint the beauty of the scene, whether it's town or uh, or landscape. And well, yeah, this this one that Rocco has brought up um, it was a monster painting, uh, ten feet wide, and I did it uh, for Hillsdale College uh, back around 2009, 2010, and it. Um, it depicts the signing of the Constitution. It took two years to uh, research, to plan, and to execute it. And it hangs in the college's uh, study center for the Constitution in uh, Washington, DC. And Sam, I, I, I've gotten some feedback that says you're an inspiring speaker. <laughs> and I think we could listen to you for the next three hours, to be honest oh. with you. Oh, you you poor souls. <laughs> You're too, all too kind. <laughs> but we'll have to thank end it so there. Much. And uh, again, I want to thank you for participating. And and if, if you people that are on the call, if there's people that you'd like to dive into more uh, and get them on our talk, uh, we, we can do that. I'm trying to do these things like once a month throughout the winter. And in December, uh, uh, not Donald, but uh, I've got a Gooch. Uh, Donald Gooch was the founding father. Peter, Peter and I went to school together, and uh, he's a great painter as well. And uh, love to hear his story. So he's going to be on in mid December. But after that, I don't have anybody else lined up just yet. So if you've got interesting people, uh, we can review that and and see if we can get them on for for our talk. So with that. Again, uh, Sam, thanks for, for, I hope to see you in person someday. And, uh, Likewise. and uh, we'll get together, but uh, everyone have a great day. And I'm off to other volunteer duties. Take <laughs> Good care. Luck. Safe drive. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you. You bet. Thank you. Thank you. You're yes. welcome. And recording.